good day everyone so this is the chapter on refrigeration for MEC 551 thermal engineering this chapter refrigeration we will be covering uh, a number of subtopics the main objectives of this chapter are as follow the first one is uh, all the students will be introduced to the concepts of refrigerators and heat pumps and the measure of their performance so from this you will learn what is a refrigerator and also what is a heat pump and how to measure their performance next we will analyze the ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle so this is one of the basic refrigeration cycle that we will cover under this topic and we will also analyze the actual vapor compression refrigeration cycle then this will be followed by reviewing the factors involved in selecting the right refrigerant for any application so for the refrigeration cycle we will need a refrigerant and there are various refrigerants available in the market so we will need to know how to select the right refrigerant for an application then this will be followed by a discussion on the operation of refrigeration and heat pipe system and uh, towards the end of this chapter you will be introduced to the concepts of absorption refrigeration system innovative vapor compression refrigeration system and gas refrigeration systems so let's begin with our introduction i'm sure you are familiar with refrigeration all of us we've got a refrigerator at home so do you know how it works what is the function of a refrigerator at home so if you look at the diagram that is shown here what we have is we have a carton of milk and this milk must be kept cold if you want to preserve it for a longer period of time so what the refrigerator does is it takes away the heat from the milk carton and then make sure that it is uh, kept in a cold environment so that you can preserve the content of this milk carton which is the milk itself so that you can use it for a longer period of time if you leave this milk outside in the outdoor environment this milk will spoil within a few hours or within a day so in order to increase the shelf life of this milk we will need to refrigerate it and that's where the refrigerators in our house comes in imagine your life today without refrigerator so let's do some history on the refrigeration so the earliest and most common of the cold substance used for taking away heat was ice and snow so malaysia we don't get ice or snow but in cold climate countries during winter they get a lot of ice or snow uh, in uh, some countries like iran they used to collect snow during winter and they used to uh, keep them underground and then they use it in the summer for food preservation so the chinese greeks romans etc they've all used ice for food preservation now if you look at the definition here refrigeration is nothing but a process of making something cold and cold can be defined as an absence of heat and why we need to make something cold it's because we want to extend the shelf life of that particular food product <coughs> it is mainly used for food uh, extending the shelf life of food products but now we know that in industries refrigeration is used in many many applications which we will see in this chap chapter later on now this is an example of a refrigeration machine that was developed in the 1834 as you can see it's a very crude machine it used to run with the help of a very very uh, big compressors like this they were either run manually or they were powered by steam engines and uh, the basic components of a refrigeration cycle as you can see or refrigeration system consists of evaporator where your refrigerant evaporates to absorb the heat 
which goes through a valve and then uh, you have a condenser where you reject the heat into the environment and the compressor is where the refrigerant is compressed to high pressure and also to high temperature. So this was the refrigeration machine they used in 1834. It was very very big and mainly used in the industries or factories to produce ice and then this ice in turn was used for food preservation. Then in the 1950s we managed to shrink the compressor but it was still a very big bulky compressor. Again this was run either by a steam engine or by that time we would have got electricity and this was run by electrical motors or by electricity. So this compressor again was very bulky and mainly it was the application of refrigeration was limited to industrial applications where they were used to manufacture ice and then that ice was then sold to uh, individuals for their domestic application. So again the components here as you, as you can see it consists of compressor, evaporator, you have an expansion valve and also a condenser. So these were the refrigeration machine in the 50s. Then came the 60s, 70s and 80s. We were able to shrink the compressor to a very small uh, component and then we started having refrigerators at home and then this is what you see for refrigeration machines that you find at home and what it does is the compressor actually delivers the refrigerant to the hot condenser coil where the heat rejection place heat rejection takes place and then this is returned via the expansion valve to the uh, evaporator section in the refrigerator to absorb the heat from the confined space and then this is the process and is then repeated again and again. As you can see refrigerator is a very reliable piece of equipment. They hardly break down and they require almost zero maintenance. A refrigerator can last if it's taken care properly more than 10 to 15 years and it is an essential device or essential machinery that we must have in each of our homes today. As you can see from this slide, this slide shows the overview of energy consumption for refrigeration cycles. So if you look at Malaysia, overall our refrigeration cycle involving in the heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems or the, our air conditioning system constitutes to almost about 45.1%. So in other words, refrigeration or air conditioning consumes a lot of energy. So if you look at the another pie chart here, as you can see for a typical education building like what we have in uh, UITM, you can see that the refrigeration cycle or the heating, ventilating and air conditioning systems that relies on refrigeration cycle uh, consumes almost about 65% of the total energy consumption for a building. You can see food services, laboratories and lighting, they are consuming uh, energy which is much much less compared to the uh, heating ventilation and air conditioning systems. So this 65% is a huge chunk of energy consumption. So here in this chapter hopefully we will understand what is a refrigeration cycle and perhaps you as an engineer in the future can come out with a better design with a better refrigeration cycle innovative designs, much efficient refrigeration cycle so that we can reduce the energy consumptions by the uh, refrigeration cycle related heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems. Now we will cover what is a refrigerator and what is a heat pump. Now we know the from the science of heat transfer the transfer of heat is only from the hot region to the cold region. You cannot have heat transfer from the cold region to the hot region. So, But in refrigerators, the transfer of heat is from a low temperature region to a high temperature region. So this is not natural. So in order to do this, if you want to transfer heat from a low temperature region to a high temperature region, you need a special device. And this special device is called refrigerator. 
Now the main purpose of a refrigeration as you can see here is to transfer heat from a chamber so that the temperature inside is reduced to below that of its surrounding. That is the main purpose. Now besides refrigerator we have another device that transfers heat from a low temperature medium to a high temperature one and we call that a heat pump. Basically a refrigerator and a heat pump they are the same thing but they differ in their objectives. Right? So you can see here refrigerators and heat pumps are essentially the same devices but they differ only in their objectives. As you can see in this diagram figure 11.1 we have both the refrigerator and heat pump. So the refrigerator, the function of a refrigerator is to maintain a cold refrigerated space in a confined area like your fridge. So you absorb the heat from this cold refrigerated space with the help of this refrigeration cycle and then this heat is then rejected to the warm environment. You don't use the heat. Your objective here is to maintain the cold refrigerated space. Whereas in a heat pump, you have the same processes but here the objective is different. We absorb the heat from the cold environment and we reject it to the confined space. For an example in this case here we've got a house where we need to heat up the house because this house is uh, experiencing uh, cold weather in winter. So what you do is you absorb heat from the cold environment outside where it's snowing. Absorb the heat from there. And then with the help of a heat pump, you, you supply this heat so that you can warm a house during winter. So as you can see here, the devices are the same, but the objective of a refrigerator is to maintain a cold refrigerated space by rejecting heat into the warm environment. But for a heat pump is you absorb the heat from the cold environment and you maintain a warm refrigerated space you, you can say that right so these are some of the important terms that you should know and then uh, we have uh, this term called coefficient of performance coefficient of performance is nothing but the efficiency of the refrigeration cycle now why we use coefficient of performance and not efficiency is because in a refrigeration cycle your desired output can be more than your required input as a result of that, your COP can be more than unity. So it can be more than one. So in order to avoid the confusion, so instead of using efficiency, we use the term coefficient of performance here. Now you have coefficient of performance for both the refrigerator and heat pump. Both are defined as desired output divided by required input. So for both the refrigerator and heat pump, the required input is the same, which is the work done by the compressor. But the desired output for a refrigerator is the cooling effect. And the desired output for a heat pump is the heating effect. So they will differ in terms of your COP definition for both refrigerator and heat pump in terms of QL and QH for both the refrigerator and heat pump. So you need to know the formula for both the refrigerator and heat pump and it is defined as this. Now based on this, these relations can also be expressed in the rate form by replacing the quantities QL, QH and WNET by Q.L, Q.H and WNET in respectively. This relation implies, so this relation here, the last relation that you have got, COP HP equals to COP R plus 1, that COP for heat pump can be more than 1 since COP for refrigerant is a positive quantity. That is, heat pump functions at worst as a resistance heater, supplying as much energy to the house as it consumes. In reality, part of the QH is lost to the outside air through piping and other devices. And COP for heat pump may drop below unity when the outside air temperature is too low. So when this happens, the system normally switches to the fuel powered by natural gas, propane or oil or resistance heating mode. 
Now, the cooling capacity of a refrigeration system, that is, the rate of heat removal from the refrigerated space, is often expressed in terms of tons of refrigeration. Now, for an example, one ton of refrigeration is equivalent to 211 kilojoule per minute or 200 BTU per minute. So, a typical house with an area of 200 meters squared, you will have a cooling capacity load of almost 3 ton. And that translates to about 10 kilowatt. And you can use this value to design the refrigeration system that you need for the air conditioning purposes, which we will cover in the next. Now, let's go on to our next part, which is the cycle. So, the cycle that is used to define refrigeration is called refrigeration cycle. And we use working fluid. In a refrigeration cycle, you need a working fluid. For your KGM442, we will be focusing only on R134A. So this is the refrigerant that we use to operate our cycle, the refrigeration cycle that we have. And again, as you can see here, this is the refrigeration cycle that you have. So from the evaporator, it goes into compressor, compressed, and then goes into a condenser. Then you have expansion valve and the cycle repeats again and again. So you need a refrigerant in this cycle. So same thing happens in the heat pump, uh, what do you call it, heat pump. So uh, you can use the same refrigerant or a different refrigerant. So there are various refrigerants, right? But before we go into that, we have two parameters that we need to cover. So one is the QL here, as you can see here. And then another one is the QH. So QL is nothing but the magnitude of heat removed from refrigerated space at temperature TL. So this is the heat removed from the refrigerated space at temperature TL. Right? And QH is nothing but the heat rejected to the warm space at temperature TH. So please bear in mind, it's very important for you to know these parameters. Now this table here gives you some of the refrigerants that are quite common used in uh, a refrigeration system. So they are actually denoted by the letter R which tells you that this is a refrigerant and they have a series of number after the letter R. And based on the series of number that you have, then it can be either in a methane series, ethane series and so on. And you can also have its safety category and the glide category as well. Heat pump and air conditioners have the same mechanical components. So as you can see here, we have a heat pump which is operating on a heating mode and a heat pump operation in a cooling mode. So therefore, it is not economical to have two separate systems to meet the heating and cooling requirements of a building. So you can have one single uh, system. So for an example, if you have an air conditioner, so the air conditioner can also act as a heat pump and also as a aircon, de uh, depending on how you run the cycle. So one system can be used as a heat pump in winter and, and, and an air conditioner in summer. So this is uh, basically accomplished by adding a reversing valve on the cycle. So as you can see here, we have a reversing valve. So if you add this in a cycle, then you can have a heat pump operating in a cooling mode, right, where it supplies cool air, and then you can also have a heat pump operating in a heating mode. So as a result of this modification, the condenser of the heat pump located indoors functions as the evaporator of the air conditioner in summer, right? So also the evaporator, evaporator of the heat pump, which is located outdoors, serves as the condenser of the air conditioner. So this feature increases the competitiveness of the heat pump. So such dual purposes units are commonly used in uh, many motels and hotels in the United States of America. In our next part, we will now look into the refrigerants. So refrigerant is the working fluid that is used in a, any refrigeration cycle. So there are many refrigerants. So we need to uh, 
look into various type of refrigerants and then uh, we can categorize them in terms of uh, their performance uh, using the coefficient of performance uh, value uh, we will uh, i'll introduce you to the uh, earlier refrigerants that we've used and then uh, what are the new refrigerants that we are using now and what are the various refrigerants available depending on the application either you want to use it for domestic applications or industrial applications there are many types of refrigerant as you can see in this diagram the table gives you the refrigerant that are mainly based on cfc so as you remember cfc is your chlorofluorocarbon based uh, refrigerants these are very dangerous refrigerants because if your refrigerator or air conditioning system leaks this refrigerant can thin the ozone layer and as a result it will allow more uv rays to come into our planet and for human beings uv rays are very very dangerous so this refrigerant was used initially in our refrigerators but in most countries they are banned now because they destroy the ozone layer of our planet and they have been replaced by much more environmental friendly refrigerants so to select refrigerant there are two important parameters that you should pay attention to one is the temperature of the refrigerated space so when the refrigerant actually expands in the expansion valve the temperature of uh, as a result of that expansion must be at least 10 degrees lower than the required temperature of the refrigerated space and the other criteria is that the refrigerant that we use must be environmental friendly it cannot be uh, destroying the environment in case of if there are any leaks from the refrigeration system uh, we have r134a which we'll be discussing this extensively in our chapter here it has replaced r12 which i've told you earlier that uh, these are chlorofluorocarbon based it damages ozone layer and they are mainly used in domestic refrigerators as well as automotive air conditioners r502 which is a blend of these two refrigerants uh, they are mainly used in the commercial refrigeration system such as those in supermarkets all right shopping malls all right uh, in factories and so now as you can see in this table the cop comparison between different refrigerants under same operating conditions we notice that the ammonia has got a higher cop but we can't use ammonia as in our domestic application because ammonia is very toxic in case of any leakage this can come this can cause a lot of harm to human beings so but the industries if they can place this refrigerant or the refrigeration cycle outside of their premises then ammonia is the preferred refrigerant to be used for their refrigeration system because it has got the highest cop this is followed by propane butane chlorodifluoromethane tetrafluoroethane and so on right up to carbon dioxide which has got a cop of almost 2.96 we will now move on to the application of refrigeration so as you can see here uh, we mainly use refrigerant uh, not just for our uh, human comfort we also use it for food processing food processing preservation and also distribution now imagine if you have uh, uh, meat products dairy products and also vegetable these are all perishables if you don't refrigerate them they will be spoiled uh, within a day and uh, it will not be safe for human consumption anymore but if we can uh, preserve them by means of refrigeration then all the food that you have can last for a very long period of time now for an example if you look at this column so these are all your food products right so let's concentrate on the meat products first so if you leave your meat product under room temperature it will 
not last for more than a day. But if you refrigerate it under 22 degrees Celsius, the longest it will last you will be a day. But if you can store it under 0 degrees Celsius, and how to achieve this 0 degrees Celsius is of course by means of refrigeration, then the meat product can last you almost about 6 to 10 days. Now if you go further down, if you reduce this temperature further, then the meat product can last you even longer, perhaps months. All right. So same thing is applicable for fish. Poultry is your chicken. right? So everyone likes to eat chicken. So if you store it in uh, 38 degrees Celsius, it won't last you more than a day. All right? 22 degrees is only about a day. And then if you go to the supermarket and so on, you will see that the poultry products that you get, they are actually storing it at a temperature of 0 degrees Celsius or even lower so that the shelf life increases. Right? We also have dry meats and fish. Right? So we have dry meats and fish. So if you store it at room temperature, perhaps you can go a maximum of almost a year. Right? At a lower temperature, it can go up to almost two and a half years to three years. Right? And if you store it, refrigerate it, it can last you more than 1,000 days. Right? Same things for your fruits, dry fruits, right? leafy vegetable, right? you harvest it from camera highlands, right? you, can, you need to consume it within 3 days. Right? But if you store it at a cool temperature, 22 degrees Celsius, uh, you can uh, have the vegetables to stay fresh for almost 7 days, but if you refrigerate it, it can last you up to 20 days. Right? Same thing with your root crops, right? all your ubis, potatoes and so on. If you refrigerate them, it will last you almost 300 days. That's about a year. And then if you have dry seeds, it will last you almost three years. All right? As compared to when you don't have any refrigeration. So if you look at the importance of refrigeration, it is very important in terms of food preservation. Right? So our population, as you can see, we have more than 7 billion people right now on our planet. And then it is straining our food production. So refrigeration helps us to preserve our food so that it's, it will not perish, right? So because all of these are perishable products and then it will help us to uh, meet our food security. Right? So that's uh, one of the application of refrigeration system. Now there are also other applications of refrigerants, right? So we mainly use refrigerant not just for food preservation or our human comfort. We also use it for chemical and process industries, right? So if you want to separate gases, right, nitrogen, carbon dioxide and so on. So you also need refrigeration, condensation of gases. Obviously, you will need refrigeration to lower down the temperature, solidification of solute, storage of liquid at low pressure, right? So low pressure, uh, liquid nitrogen and so on, all right? And you have removal of heat reaction during exothermic processes. So too much heat is produced during exothermic processes. So you will need refrigeration to remove this excess heat and not to forget the recovery of solvents. So if you want to find out further, you can always refer to online materials available on each of these processes and you will get in-depth detail and explanation on how each of this is achieved through refrigeration. Now coming back to our domestic refrigeration and air conditioner. So you can see here, this is, these are the two most uh, famous refrigeration products that we have in our home. So you have a fridge at home. So why do you need a fridge? Because again, you want to refrigerate your food products, all your perishable products. So if you keep your milk here, you can keep your milk to last more than few days instead of just leaving it outside right so these are the main components that you have in your refrigerator so your evaporator coil is always located at the top shelf here right you also have a compressor right so it's the bulky usually it's in uh, black in color with the uh, compressor motor run by electricity and you also have heating coil sometimes at the back and sometimes at the bottom right and then uh, the entire fridge is then heavily insulated so that you don't gain any heat from outside and you can keep the refrigerated space at the desired temperature that you choose to. Right? So that is a refrigerator. We also have air conditioners. 
So this is an example of a split unit air conditioner. So where you have the evaporator coil here, right? So this is usually connected by another set of pipe, right? Where the refrigeration is uh, delivered to the condenser where the heat rejection takes place with the help of a fan here. And then once the heat rejection is accomplished, the refrigerant is then recycled back into the evaporative section to absorb more heat from the confined space. So these are the two uh, examples that you have for the domestic refrigerator and air conditioner that you can find everywhere in Malaysia. We also have uh, chillers, right? So for domestic application, the refrigerator and the air conditioner that you have is basically a very compact unit a very small unit but if you want to cool down a building such as our uh, education building that we have tower one tower two and all the other blocks then we will need very very big compressors and very very big chillers right so if you are interested you can go down to level three of our tower one and you will see that we have these chillers right uh, situated there to provide the cooling load needed to cool down our building at tower one and all the related blocks that we have at food production uh, industries and also uh, big restaurants so they will have a cold room so a cold room is nothing but a big refrigerator where you can store large quantities of food products so these are also some application and examples of refrigeration system but these two are basically on a very large scale now we will move on into the reversed Carnot cycle of the refrigeration system as i have explained to you our refrigeration system operates between two uh, temperature range which is the tl and also TH. So TL is the lower temperature, TH is the higher temperature range. So this reverse Carnot cycle, it is not suitable model for refrigeration cycle. Later I will show you what are the processes, right? So let's go into the uh, refrigeration cycle as shown in this diagram here. And uh, you have the TS diagram. So the Carnot, the reverse Carnot cycle is sketched here. As you can see, process 1, 2 is nothing but the process that is going where the refrigerant is going through the evaporator. And as the refrigerant goes through the evaporator, it absorbs heat from the cold medium. Right? So that is the process 1, 2 represented on the Carnot diagram here. So this heat is absorbed. Then from process 2, 3, it goes through a compressor isentropically. And then it reaches to point 3 here. Then from point 0.3 to point 0.4, it, is, it goes through a condenser. And in this condenser, it is where you reject heat to the warm medium at TH. And then it is back to point 0.1 through a turbine here. So we use turbine to represent our reverse Carnot cycle. And this is done isentropically again, straight line down. And then that completes the entire cycle, one cycle of the refrigeration system. And you can continuously do this to reach the desired cold medium refrigerated space that you want. Now, this reverse Carnot cycle in actual practice is not suitable because your process 2, 3 and 4, 1 occurs in the uh, liquid vapor mixture zone. Now, if you have your compression from 0.2 to 3, which occurs in the liquid, we have the, uh, what you call that, the dome. And then under the dome, as you can see, uh, we have a mixture of vapor and liquid. If you deliver this mixture of vapor and liquid into the compressor, the, proce the, the process from 2 to 3 will not be practical. And uh, this is because the compressor will need to handle two phases. And uh, process 4.1 also involves a mixture of liquid and vapor. And this expansion of high moisture content refrigerant in a turbine is also not desirable. So we will see how we can modify the reverse Carnot cycle in our next slide. 
but I would like to bring your attention to the coefficient of performance. Uh, how to calculate the coefficient of performance for reverse Carnot cycle for a refrigerant refrigeration cycle? This is given as 1 over TH over TL minus 1. And for a heat pump, you have a formula which is slightly different than that. You have to memorize this formula because this is the COP is something that we will need to find for every refrigeration or heat pump cycle. And you can see that this is given by TH over TL. Now TH is the temperature at this region. TL is the temperature at this region. And both the temperatures must be in Kelvin. If you use degree Celsius, then you will get a wrong value for COP. Now both COPs increase as the difference between the two temperatures decrease. That is, as TL rises, TH will fall. Right? So this is another important thing that you need to remember. Now, let's look at the ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle. So earlier we were doing the uh, reverse Carnot cycle. This is the ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle. So for an uh, ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle, you will see that all the components are same except for the expansion valve. In our Carnot refrigeration cycle we had a turbine here now we have replaced the turbine with an expansion valve why we do that we will discuss that in a while right so the 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 reverse Carnot cycle why we call it a reverse Carnot cycle is because if you look at the direction on the ts diagram it is a counterclockwise right so here we are doing ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle. As I've uh, explained to you, we have replaced the turbine in the ideal reverse Carnot cycle to our ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle. Here we have changed the turbine into expansion valve. Right. So these are the processes. Right. Unlike the reverse Carnot cycle, the refrigerant is vaporized completely before it is compressed, and the turbine is replaced with a throttling valve. So these are the two important differences between the ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle and the reverse Carnot cycle. So process 1, 2. So now we want to draw the TS diagram. So this is how the TS diagram will look like. As you will see that you don't have a square anymore under the dome. So what we have done is, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, we don't want two-phase vapor here. That means we don't want a mixture of liquid and vapor here. We want only a single phase vapor here. So you've extended the point number one in the Carnot cycle to the edge of the dome here. So once you reach here, your vapor is saturated. So now this is then sent into the compressor. So you have isentropic compression in a compressor for process one, two. And at point two, from saturated vapor at point 1, point 2 becomes a superheated vapor region. So this is very important as we will be using this for our calculations later on. Remember at point 1 here, it is at saturated vapor. This is at superheated vapor. Then from point 2 to 3, point 2 to 3 in the condenser here, we have constant pressure heat rejection in a condenser. So this is then... You reject the heat. As you reject the heat, the temperature drops from this point to this point, And this is done all at constant pressure. So this will then go from a superheated region right up to the saturated liquid region. And then from 3 to 4, we have the throttling in an expansion device. So this throttling, instead of going isentropically in a turbine, because we are using an expansion valve, it will be deviating in this manner. So this will go from 3 to 4. And then from 4 to 1, you have the evaporator region again, where you have constant pressure heat absorption in an evaporator. So basically, these are the four processes that you can find in an ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle. So this is the most widely used cycle for refrigerators. 
air conditioning systems and also heat pumps so we don't use the carnot carnot is only for the reverse carnot cycle is only for the theoretical but we will use this ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle now again come back to the uh, ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle so this is how it's represented schematically in actual practice this is how it's represented if you have your fridge at home at the back of the fridge at the bottom you will see a compressor so this compressor right will send the compressed liquid through the condenser coil which are also located at the back of your refrigerator once it has rejected heat then it will go through the capillary tube or the expansion valve and then after that it will go through the evaporator coils that are located at the top of your refrigerator very near to your freezer compartment this way you can then maintain the temperature in the freezer compartment at a very low temperature which is negative 18 and we know these temperatures are very important if you want to preserve the food or prolong the shelf life of your food product so you have four components the first one is compressor and what is the function of the compressor compressor is there to provide the driving force for the entire system by drawing low pressure refrigerant from here in and adding pressure such that it exits at high temperature so that is the use of a compressor now condenser is nothing but you exhaust the heat out of the system all right so you'll have a temperature gradient because the temperature here is high temperature of the warm environment is low so you can then have heat transfer taking place from the hot play hot region to the cold region then you have expansion valve it allow the refrigerant to expand dramatically in a control process such that it exits the valve at low quality liquid vapor mixture and finally you have the evaporator to absorb heat from the cold space by virtue of temperature gradient because you have this expansion so this expansion allows you to absorb the heat from the cold refrigerated space and this is again uh, as i have shown you the refrigeration machine at home so this is where the heat is being absorbed and this is where the heat is being rejected so some formulas that we need to understand right before we move in further now uh, we have discussed about ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle we have also discussed about the reverse Carnot cycle uh, I would like to point out here that the reverse Carnot cycle is the most efficient refrigeration cycle operating between two specified temperature levels so it is only natural to look at it first as a prospective ideal cycle for refrigerators and heat pumps All right the two isothermal heat transfer processes are not difficult to achieve in practice since maintaining a constant pressure automatically fixes the temperature of two phase mixture at the saturation point so this and this is not a problem now why we change to ideal again as i've mentioned we need the compressor to have only a single phase and uh, why we replace the turbine imagine if this is your fridge and you have a turbine located here it is going to be very very costly and it is going to be a very very complex design so although if you look at the diagram here on the ts diagram the cooling capacity is given by the area under the graph here if you have a turbine so the process instead of going from here to here the turbine process will go from 3 to 4 prime here which will give you the added cooling capacity here now this added cooling capacity will definitely increase your uh, COP but having a turbine in a refrigerator instead of a, uh, what you call that expansion valve will increase your cost and complexity of the system right so replacing the expansion valve by a turbine is not practical right it's not practical since the added benefits of this cooling capacity here cannot justify the added cost and complexity so as a result of that we will not use turbine here we will still maintain capillary tube or uh, expansion valve right so these are the steady flow energy balance equations that we will be using in our practice later on 
and the COP for a refrigeration refrigerator is given by this formula COP for a heat pump is given by this formula and you can actually calculate out your COP based on the enthalpy values all right for QL you can calculate out the difference in enthalpy between 0.1 and 0.4 and the work net in into the compressor the difference in enthalpy between 0.2 and 0.1 and for a COP for a heat pump the definition is slightly different so you need to calculate for your QH for QH the difference in enthalpy between 0.2 and 0.3 and W net in is similar to 0.2 and 0.1 the difference between enthalpies of 0.2 and 0.1 now bear in mind H1 which is located at the edge of the dome line here is at saturated vapor region. So you have to find Hg at this pressure P1 and if you look at your H3, H3 here is at liquid saturated liquid region. So you have to find H4. So we will then do some uh, exercises but bear in mind this is the norm that we use when we calculate our or when we find our values for enthalpy at point H1 and point H3. Now what about H2? H1 is saturated vapor. H3 is saturated liquid. What about point 2? Point 2 is superheated. Right? So we will look in the table later on what is the superheated region. Now this is a TS diagram you should be able to draw this TS diagram out based on the information given to you in the question. You can also re uh, represent ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle using a pH diagram. So you can see here pH diagram again you have a similar dome which is different than this. Process 1 2 where the work is uh, required by the compressor as shown here. And then press uh, point 0.2 to 4 at constant pressure where heat is rejected and point 0.3 to 4 again at constant uh, enthalpy and then process 4.1 where heat absorption takes place at constant pressure again. So most of the time in our practice we will emphasize a lot on our TS diagram but bear in mind that we also have pH diagrams that you can use to solve problems related to ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle. So now we will uh, just do a quick review of our thermodynamics first law. So thermodynamics first law is again based on uh, conservation of energy principle. So here you have uh, uh, relations in uh, refrigeration cycles that we will use to determine the amount of energy uh, that is being uh, used for some of the processes in the refrigeration cycle. So you can see here based on the units, so we have kilojoule per kilogram, right? So that will be the relationships, relationship given to you. And uh, bear in mind that the kinetic portion and the potential energy portion of this relationship will be ignored. Right, so you can assume this to be zero. So we will be concentrating only on the H2 and H1. So similarly, so this is uh, in terms of uh, per kilogram, right? And if you have uh, in kilojoule, again uh, you will have your mass flow rate here multiplying with your H2 and H1. So we will neglect the kinetic part and also the potential energy part, right? So if you change your mass into mass flow rate then you will have your units in kilowatt again this is the actual relationship right so if you want to find the q dot minus w dot right the relationship will give you m dot h2 minus h1 again bear in mind this quantity and this quantity is assumed to be zero and uh, i'm sure all of you are aware what is a control volume so this is just a very quick review right so you have a steady flow compressor as shown in the diagram here right so you have mass going in so this mass will be compressed and then it will come out with uh, m dot out 2 which is illustrated here in order to add pressure you will need to consume some energy all right so some work must be done to the compressor so here I would like to introduce you the definition of a compressor. So compressors are nothing but devices 
used to increase pressure of a fluid. Now you need to supply work. So work is supplied to these devices from an external source through a rotating shaft. Right? So therefore, your compressors involve work input. So this is why you have the work input into the compressor. And this is your energy balance for compressor. Right? So as mentioned earlier, our compressor works in an adiabatic condition. So heat transfer can be neglected or you can assume them to be zero. Right, we have work input, right? So there's no work output, so this can be assumed to be zero. Uh, there is no kinetic change, there is no potential change, so these two terms can be neglected again. So once you have finalized everything and uh, take out the terms that we don't want, and you will be left with this term, and then you simplify it, and this is the amount of work that you need to supply to the compressor based on this relationship so it's m dot h2 minus h1 now bear in mind this formula is very important when you want to find out how much work is consumed by the compressor right in a refrigeration cycle so you need to know uh, this formula either you memorize it you understand it because we'll be using this again and again in the refrigeration cycle. <coughs> now if you still remember in your thermodynamics we also have uh, an efficiency called isentropic efficiency, right? So, uh, why we study isentropic efficiency is because we want to closely relate our processes to the ideal cases, right? So, the more closely the actual process approximates the idealized isentropic process, the better the device performs. So thus, it will be desirable to have a parameter that expresses quantitatively how efficiently the actual device approximates an idealized one. So this is what we call an isentropic efficiency. So this is the definition here. right? So isentropic efficiency is nothing but a measure of deviation of actual processes from the corresponding idealized one. So this is your isentropic process. right? So this is the idealized process. So we have a deviation of the actual process. So we want to know how much is the deviation in terms of percentage. So for different devices, isentropic efficiencies are defined differently. Right? So here we will be talking about compressor isentropic efficiency. So the definition is given as here. Right? So the isentropic of efficiency of a compressor is defined as the ratio of the work input required to raise the pressure of a gas to a specified value in an isentropic manner to the actual work input. Right? So this is the definition that is given to you. So please notice that the isentropic compressor efficiency is defined with the isentropic work input in the numerator instead of the denominator. This is because Ws is a smaller quantity than Wa and this definition prevents your isentropic efficiency for the compressor becoming greater than 100% which would falsely imply that the actual compressor performed better than the isentropic ones which is not the case. Right? Also notice that the inlet conditions and the exit pressure of the gas are the same for both the actual and isentropic compressors. Right? So when the changes in kinetic and potential energies of gas being compressed are negligible, then your work input to an adiabatic compressor becomes equal to the change in enthalpy. So then we can then rewrite this formula into this formula. Right? So that's an approximation. We can use this approximation uh, in any calculation involves the isentropic efficiency for a compressor in a refrigeration cycle. So H2S is given here, right? H1 is here, and this is the H2A for the actual. So how to use these uh, relations in terms of calculating the isentropic efficiency? We will uh, look into the uh, examples later on, all right? So another note that you need to uh, understand here is that the value of isentropic efficiency for a compressor greatly depends on the design of the compressor. So if you have a well-designed compressors, right, they will have isentropic efficiencies that range from 80 to 90%. Right? 
So that is uh, some note that you need to know for isentropic efficiency. You need to know the definition. You need to know the formulas related to the isentropic efficiency for a compressor in terms of the enthalpies. And this diagram is important. As you can see here, you have enthalpy versus entropy diagram, right? Bear in mind, this is very important because for an idealized case, right, which is going in a vertical straight line, S2S is equal to S1. And this, this will help us to find the values of H right, that we are looking for. So we will discuss this in the examples later on. Now these are some of the formulas that you can use. So based on our first law uh, results for compressor, if you want to calculate out the work in, right, based on the mass flow rate, is given by mass flow rate times the difference of enthalpy between 0.2 and 0.1. In the condenser, QH is given by mass flow rate times the difference of enthalpies between 0.2 and 0.3. Expansion valve, bear in mind that we assume our enthalpy at 0.3 is almost similar to enthalpy at 0.4. And evaporator, you are given QL equals to M dot H1 minus H4. And then these are the COP values. So you have to... You have to memorize the COP values for refrigerator, COP values for a heat pump based on this definition and also based on this definition. And this is for heat pump. You will see that they are slightly different. This is for L. This is for H. And then you will see that W in for both the compressors, you will have the same. Uh, difference in enthalpy, but for heat pump, the H, the difference in enthalpies are between H2 minus H3. Here he is H1 minus H4. So you need to memorize this because you'll be using this a lot in your uh, practices later on. And then the, based on the first law, we have these are the equations that you need to know for your compressor. These are the equations that you need to know for your condenser. This is the relationship between H3 and H4 for expansion valve. And then this is the QL relation for your evaporator region. Some other definitions that you should know. So we have here refrigeration effect, refrigeration load and refrigeration capacity. So refrigeration effect, all right, QL, kilojoule per kilogram, is defined as the heat extracted by a unit mass of refrigerant during the evaporating process in the evaporator. All right, so please remember the symbol and also the unit used for refrigeration effect. And if you have a refrigeration load, so that becomes your capital QL. So this is in kilowatt. See that it's different from this unit. This is the required rate of heat extraction by the refrigerant in the evaporator, right? Finally, when you are talking about refrigeration capacity, this is also known as your cooling capacity, QRC in kilowatt, is the actual rate of heat extracted by the refrigerant in the evaporator, right? So you, you need to know the definition of this because sometimes the questions will ask you to find these values based on this definition. Now let's look at our problem here. So we have a problem based on ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle. So what you have here is a refrigerator uses refrigerant 134A as the working fluid and operates on an ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle between two pressure limits which are 0 0.14 megapascal and 0 0.8 megapascal. If the mass flow rate of the refrigerant is 0.05 kilogram per second, you are asked to determine these four parameters. Rate of heat removal, which is QL. Power input, W in. Rate of heat rejection to the environment, which is your QH. And the COP of the refrigerator. Now, your ability to draw this TS diagram will be tested again and again. So most of the time you will be given this problem statement 
you should be able to at least sketch out this TS diagram based on this information given. So in this problem, the TS diagram is given. So we know that this is an ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle. And these are the points that are of interest to us. This is where the heat is absorbed. This is where the compressor work is coming in. And this is where the heat is rejected. And this is the point of saturated liquid. And this is the point of saturated vapor. And the expansion valve direction goes from here to here. And we know the enthalpy at point 3 and point 4 can be approximated to be same. So now this is the uh, skeleton that I'm going to provide to you. But you will need to fill in all the empty blanks here. right? Now uh, we have four points. Point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3 and point 0.4. At point 0.1, we need to find what is the enthalpy. So to do that, we need to know what is the pressure. So the question tells you the pressure at point 0.1 is 0 0.14 megapascal. Now you, you need to know whether this is a saturated vapor, superheated or saturated liquid. We have discussed this that at point 0.1, the condition is that this is a saturated vapor region. So we go to table A12, we find saturated refrigerant 134A. Since pressure is given to us, we will use the pressure table. Now look at the pressure. Our pressure given to us is 0 0.14 mega pascal. So if it's 0 0.14 mega pascal, so we look for the pressure. 0 0.14 mega pascal is nothing but your 140 kilopascal. And then we extrapolate here. We go and look for our enthalpy. So now enthalpy, you have saturated liquid and saturated vapor, right? So here we have saturated vapor. So we will go to the section of saturated vapor. So at 140, the value for saturated vapor is 239.16. And then that will be the value here, 239.16. Now if you look at it, temperature versus entropy. So you can also find the entropy at point 1. So entropy at point 1 is given here. So again, 140 kilopascal, which translates to 0 0.14 megapascal. We go and find our entropy at saturated vapor, so which will give us a value of 0 0.94456. So you can jot it down here. Then we move on to point number two. Now point number two is at superheated region. So the moment it goes into superheated region, you can't use this table anymore. Then you will need to go and look for superheated refrigerated R134A table. So this is basically a table A13. I've shared this table with you all. So please learn how to use this table. So now we will look at the pressure given to us, 0 0.8 megapascal. So we go to 0 0.8 megapascal. So this is the 0 0.8 megapascal. So now how to find the H2 is, you remember we have found the entropy value at point 0.1. And you know at point 1, this is going as a straight line. So when it is going as a straight line, we know that the entropy at point 2 is also same. So we can say here S2 is equal to S1. So with these two values, so you can see here, we have entropy. So our entropy here, which we found earlier is 0 0.944. 9, 0.94456. So you see that 0 0.94456 is between 0 0.9183 and 0 0.9480. So you will need to do some interpolation in order to get your enthalpy value here, which is your H value corresponds to your H2 value. So do that and that will give you your H2 value here with some simple interpolation. Then we go to point 0.3. Point 0.3 is saturated liquid again. So this is at 0 0.8 megapascal. So we go back to this table because it's saturated. But this is saturated liquid. So we go to 0 0.8 megapascal. Why 0 0.8 megapascal? It is nothing but 800 kilopascal. So based on this 800 kilopascal, we find what is our saturated refrigerant. But not Hg. It is Hf. So we come to this saturated liquid, we get the value 95.47. So that is your H3. Now H4 is almost approximated equal to H3 throttling. So the same value here, you can write it down as the value for H4. 
So once you've got H1, H2, H3 and H4, then you can use the formulas that are derived earlier that I've shown you earlier based on the first law and the second law. You can find your QL because M dot is given. You can find your W in, right? You can find your QH. Now interesting thing here is QH has got two formulas. You can either find your QH based on M dot H2 minus H3 or you can also find QH based on the energy law where it should be equal to your QL plus W in. So this is the conservation of energy. All right. So that will give you the same answer. And this is the formula for your COP since we are using refrigerator, not heat pump. So we will use the COP for refrigerator. So that will give you your answer for COP. Please do try this question because it will test your ability on how to read this saturated refrigerant R134 table. Uh, you will then know where to find your enthalpy for the saturated liquid and saturated vapor. Also the enthropies and how to know point 2 is superheated and where to find the value of enthalpy for the superheated region for a given pressure. And if you are required to do some interpolation, learn how to do the interpolation in order to obtain the value for H2. So please try this question on your own. I have been, I am kind enough to provide you with a skeleton. All you need to do is just to fill up this empty spaces here. All right. So do try this question on your own. Now what we have here is actual vapor compression refrigeration cycle. In an actual vapor compression refrigeration cycle, it differs from the ideal one. Now you will see that in our previous uh, compression refrigeration cycle, we, the compression takes place isentropically, right? But in actual practice, this will not happen mainly due to fluid friction, which causes some pressure drop. And also you will have heat transfer to or from the surrounding. So as a result of that, your compression uh, process from 1 to 2 might deviate from the isentropic line here. Right? So the, there will be some differences. You will have non-isentropic compression. So this is a non-isentropic compression as compared to isentropic compression here. So you will have superheated vapor at evaporator exit. That is true for both the isentropic and non-isentropic. And you can also have subcool liquid at the condenser exit. So instead of being saturated liquid, this point might shift slightly out from the dome line here. So then it becomes the subcooled. And you can also have pressure drops in the condenser and evaporator to be similar in both the ideal and actual vapor compression refrigeration cycle. So there are only two differences here which are highlighted in pink. The other two are basically similar. And this can also be represented in your TS diagram here, which corresponds to your pH diagram here, right? And to find your isentropic efficiency, this is the formula that we'll be using, right? So H2S is basically your uh, enthalpy, isentropic enthalpy. H2 is your actual enthalpy, right? So in order to find your isentropic uh, compressor efficiency. So this is the formula that we will be using. So this indicates how closely you are operating uh, compared to the ideal vapor compression refrigeration cycle. Now we have a next problem, which is our sample problem 6.2. In our sample problem 6.2, uh, you have refrigerant 134A enters the compressor of a refrigerator as superheated vapor at 0.14 megapascal and negative 10 degrees Celsius at a rate of 0.05 kilogram per second and leaves at 0.8 megapascal and 50 degrees Celsius. So these are very important parameters. You can use this to construct your uh, TS diagram. The refrigerant is cooled in the condenser to 26 degrees C and 0.72 megapascal and is throttled to 0.15 megapascal. Now, I would like to ask you, can you draw your TS diagram based on the information given here? You should be able to, right? So disregarding any heat transfer and pressure drop in the connecting lines between the components, you are asked to determine A, the rate of heat removal from the refrigerated space, the power input to the compressor, the isentropic efficiency of the compressor, and the COP of the refrigerator. Again, for this problem, 
I have provided you with some skeleton for the solution. Uh, all you need to do is fill in the blanks, all right? So make sure you complete it, all right? So this is your TS diagram. So as you can see, based on the equation, it is superheated. It is not at saturated vapor region. So point one is already at the superheated region, and these are the parameters given to you. And then this is not isentropic. This is an actual uh, refrigeration cycle. So it deviates from your isentropic line. And these are the parameters you need for point number two. So here you can see that point number one and point number two are at, at the superheated region. Then point number three is again not located at saturated liquid region. It is slightly subcooled. But because it is slightly subcooled, we can assume it to be at the uh, saturated liquid region. And then this is throttled to 0 0.15 megapascal at uh, point number four. So to find H1, we know H1 is at superheated region. So based on the same table that I've discussed with you earlier in the previous example, you go to the superheated table for R134A. Based on these two parameters, you find what is your H1. Then you find another temp uh, pressure for the same superheated table. Based on this pressure and this temperature, you find what is your H2. Please note that these two values are found in the superheated R134A table because they are both in the superheated region here. Then P3 and T3, it's here in the subcooled region. But as I've mentioned, we can approximate it or assume that it is on the saturated liquid region because it's not far off from the dome line here. So we say that it's approximately equals to your enthalpy saturated liquid enthalpy at 26 degrees celsius so you can use that value and then since we it involves throttling you can find h4 to be equal to your h3 so that will give you the values of h1 h2 h3 and h4 and all these values are needed to solve pro, uh, your question to get your ql w in and also your cop so here you can find your uh, what you, isentropic efficiency of the compressor. So this is the formula that we've discussed earlier. You have all the values for H1 and H2. Now the question is how to find H2S. So H2S, as you can see, it's going straight up from point number one. So if you find point number one, at point number one, you need to find what is your entropy. So this entropy at point number one is similar to the entropy at point number 2s. So based on this value and this pressure, you can then find what is the enthalpy at point 2s. So try, this is already given to you. You can check with the table and then find out what is your uh, efficiency of the, uh, asyntropic efficiency of the compressor. So please do try these two uh, sample problems. Because you need to build your skill on how to read the uh, R134O table and also how to do the calculations in order to find the values for QL, W in, isentropic efficiency. You can also find what is your QH and most importantly, what is your COP. Again, pay attention to the discussion here. Once you finish both the practices, examples given here. Uh, please pay attention to the uh, discussion here. What will be the COP difference between this cycle and the previous example cycle? So you will see that they are different and look at the discussion and think about what you mean by having a higher COP for the previous one, right? And then why the COP for this one decreases and what are the reasons for it and so on and so on. Here we have an example of another type of refrigeration system. So this refrigeration system, we call it as cascade refrigeration system. So cascade here means on top of one another. So you can see here, right, you have one refrigeration system and this is cascaded onto another refrigeration system. Not necessarily you must have only two, you can have another one here and so on and so on, right? So some industrial application, they require moderately low temperatures and the temperature range they involve may be too large for a single compression refrigeration cycle to be practical. So you have a large temperature range also means a large pressure range in the cycle and poor performance for a re reciprocating compressor. 
so those are the setbacks if you want a very low temperature right so one way to of dealing with such situation is to perform the refrigeration process in stages so you do one stage and then followed by another stage so that is to have two or more refrigeration cycles that operates in series as shown in the diagram so this type of refrigeration cycle we call them as cascade refrigeration cycle so you can see a two stage so what we have here in this diagram is a two stage cascade refrigeration cycle the two cycles are connected through the heat exchanger in the middle so you have a heat exchanger in the middle this is where the heat is transferred so this is nothing but a heat exchanger which serves as the evaporator for the topping cycle all right so we have cycle a we have cycle b so this is the topping cycle all right and the condenser for the bottoming cycle so this is the bottoming cycle b so you have a condenser all right so assuming that heat exchanger is well insulated and the kinetic and potential energies are neg negligible the heat transfer from the fluid in the bottoming cycle should be equal to the heat transfer to the fluid in the topping cycle right so that we will discuss the uh, relations related to this in our next slide right but hope that you understand what is a cascade refrigeration system now so in the cascade refrigeration system the refrigerant in the both cycles are assumed to be the same right so you can use the same refrigerant here right you can assume it to be same but again bear in mind this is not necessary all right since there is no mixing taking place in the heat exchanger so you will see that there is no mixing so you can choose to have same refrigerant here and the same refrigerant can be uh, used as a working fluid here or you can change to another refrigerant right so refrigerants with more desirable characteristics can be used in each cycle right so in this case there would be a separate saturation dome for each fluid right and the ts diagram for one of the cycles would be different all right also you will notice that in actual cascade refrigeration systems the two cycles will overlap somewhat since a temperature difference between the two fluid is needed for any heat transfer to take place right so this is uh, something that you need to understand now if you look at this ts diagram you will notice these two areas right so it is clearly evident right that the compressor work decreases right so here if you use a cascade refrigeration cycle to achieve the temperature that you require for the cold refrigerated space instead of using only one compressor now you are using two compressors you can actually the de actually decrease the compressor work required for the entire refrigeration cycle and by having a cascade refrigeration system you are also able to increase the refrigeration capacity as shown in the diagram right so in short very low temperatures can be achieved by operating two or more vapor compression systems in series called cascading right so this is uh, something that you should know for cascade refrigeration system so for cascade refrigeration cycle right so we will apply the first law of our thermodynamics to the heat exchanger so by assuming that our mass flow rate is different in the topping cycle and also at the bottoming cycle right based on the values that you have for h5 and h8 then you can find the ratio of mass flow rate that is flowing in the topping cycle and also at the bottoming cycle based on these relationships right and the cop can be found for a cascade refrigeration cycle based on this formula right so please bear in mind so this is for the bottoming cycle so this is where you are absorbing all the heat right ql and then this is the amount of work required for the compressors and for the compressors you have one for the topping cycle and one for the bottoming cycle so this relationship will help you to calculate out what is the cop for the cascade refrigeration cycle besides the cascade refrigeration cycle that we've discussed earlier there is also another refrigeration system that we call as multi stage compression refrigeration cycle right 
So here, when the fluid used throughout the casket refrigeration system is the same, the heat exchanger between the stages can be replaced by a mixing chamber. So here, you don't have a heat exchanger, right? So you will replace it with a flash chamber. And you can only do that if you are using the same refrigerant for both the bottom and the top cycle, right? So here, instead of uh, using a heat exchanger, you use a mixing chamber called flash chamber. Uh, this is because flash chamber has a better heat transfer characteristics, right? So this system is called multi-stage compression refrigeration system. So now let's look what is the multi-stage compression refrigeration system in terms of a schematic diagram and also the TS diagram. So this is your multi-stage compression refrigeration system, right? So when the fluid used throughout the casket refrigeration system is the same, so you can see here, we don't have a heat exchanger. We are using the same refrigerant for the bottom cycle and also the top cycle. So the heat exchanger now can be replaced by a mixing chamber. So this mixing chamber, we call it as flash chamber, right? And why you do that is because it has better heat transfer characteristics. So you have two stage compression refrigeration system shown here in the diagram. So in this system, a liquid refrigerant expands in the first expansion valve to the flash chamber pressure right which is the same as the compressor into stage pressure part of the liquid vaporizes during this process this saturated vapor state 3 is mixed with the superheated vapor from the low pressure compressor state 2 so you can see here there is a mixing here right from point 3 to point 2 and the mixture then enters the high pressure compressor at point number 9 or state 9 so this is, in essence, a regeneration process. The saturated liquid, which is at state 7, expands through the second expansion valve into the evaporator, where it picks up the heat from the refrigerated space. Now the compression process in this system, so both the compression process in this system, resembles a two-stage compression with intercooling, and the compressor work decreases again. So this is the amount of compressor work that decreases, right? So care should be uh, exercised in the interpretation of the areas of TS diagram in, in this case, since the mass flow rates are different in different parts of the cycle, right? We will see in an example, right? So on how to deal with problems related to uh, multi-stage compression refrigeration cycles. We now go into the sample problem number three. This problem is related to casket refrigeration system. So what you have here is consider a two-stage casket refrigeration system operating between the pressure limits of 0 0.8 and 0 0.14 megapascal. Right? By now you should know uh, this pressure refers to which point on a TS diagram. So you have each stage operates on an ideal vapor compression refrigeration, refrigeration cycle with refrigerant 134A. This is important because you will need to refer to the property table and charts for R134A in order for you to obtain values, values for enthalpy for these two, temp, uh, these two pressure points. So that is your working fluid. Heat rejection from the lower cycle to the upper cycle takes place in an adiabatic counter flow heat exchanger. Right, so this is a ca casket refrigeration system employing a counter flow heat exchanger where both streams enter at about 0.32 megapascal. Right, so here note in practice the working fluid of the lower cycle is at higher pressure and, and temperature in the heat exchanger for effective heat transfer. Right, so if you want to transfer heat, the bottom cycle must have a temperature higher than the temperature at the upper cycle, topping cycle. Then only you can get the heat transfer. Right? So if the mass flow rate of the refrigerant through the upper cycle is given to you, which is 0 0.05 kg per second, you are asked to determine the mass flow rate of the refrigerant through the lower cycle. And for part B, rate of heat removal from the refrigerated space and the power input to the compressors and the COP of this casket refrigerator, right? 
So this is the question. So in uh, our next slide, I will provide you with the skeleton for you to solve this problem. So I expect you to solve this on your own, get the values based on all the examples that we have discussed before this problem. Yeah, this is uh, some of the assumptions, right? So we assume that it's steady operating condition. Both the kinetic and potential energy changes are negligible and the heat exchanger is adiabatic, right? But bear in mind in practice, it is not. So the enthalpies, right? So you have eight states, right? H1 to H8. So you need to find that, right? From the refrigerant table. Here we are using R134A. So we need to draw a TS diagram of the refrigeration cycle. So you will see that it will be shown in a uh, figure, right? So this is the figure. Right, so you have both the bottom cycle and the topping cycle shown to you. This is the pressure. So both this pressure for the uh, bottom and uh, top cycle where the heat exchange takes place in the heat exchanger is at 0 0.32 megapascal. And here you have 0 0.8 megapascal. Right, so you should know at least how to find H1, H2, H3 h4 and similarly go to find what is your h5 h6 h7 and h8 so we need all these parameters to do the calculations to solve problems from a to c so this is again the skeleton here right so if you want to find for part a mass flow rate of the refrigerant through the lower cycle so right so you can determine it through the steady flow energy balance so we have discussed this, right? So all you need to do is you need to rearrange this so that you get this relationship in the second line. So by now you have the values for H5, H8, H2 and H3. And you know the mass flow rate which is given as 0 0.05 kilogram per second, right? For M dot A. And you are asked to find what is your M dot B. So rearrange it and get the value for M dot b right next what we want to find is the rate of heat removal by a cascade cycle right so this is nothing but the rate of heat absorption in the evaporator of the lower stage so at the lower stage you use h1 minus h4 times with m dot b and that will give you the rate of heat removal right from the evaporator so that should be straightforward and then if you want to find the power input to the compressors and bear in mind we have two compressors here so both are running with different uh, mass flow rate of refrigerant so the first one is with mass flow rate a second one is with mass flow, flow rate b so for the bottom cycle you will need h2 and h1 and for the topping cycle you will need h6 and h5 so since you have these values m dot p is known m dot a is also given then you should be able to get what is the total work input to the compressors so once you know ql and also the work input to the compressors then you can find your cop right so now here there's a small note on discussion so this discussion is basically asking you to compare the cop value of this cascade refrigeration cycle right to a single stage refrigeration system based on the same pressure values right and you will see that the COP for this cascade refrigeration cycle has increased from 3.97 from a single stage, right, to a cascade refrigeration stage of 24.46, right. So here it shows that the COP of the system can be increased even more by increasing the number of cascade stages. So in short, what I would like to highlight here is cascade refrigeration system helps you to improve the performance of the overall refrigeration cycle as evident by the COP values of a single stage refrigeration system for, for the same uh, pressure values. And here you have a cascade refrigeration system where your COP is much higher compared to the single stage refrigeration system. In our next example, we will cover the multi stage compression refrigeration system. So, here you have a vapor compression plant, 
that uses R134A has a suction pressure of 0.14 megapascal and a condenser pressure of 0.8 megapascal. So vapor is dry saturated on entering the compressor and there is no undercooling of the condensate. So the compression is carried out isentropically in two stages and a flash chamber is employed. Right? So this is different compared to our earlier example. So our earlier example employs heat exchanger for the casket refrigeration system. And in this example, we are using flash chamber. Right? So this is at a pressure of 0.32 megapascal. So you are asked to calculate for part A the amount of vapor bled off at the flash chamber. So this is always in the form of X, all right, percentage of vapor that is bled off. The refrigerating effect for part B, part C requires you to find the compressor work. And finally, what is your COP for the entire system? Now, first thing first, you should be able to draw out your TS diagram based on the information given. So again, I'll provide you with the skeleton. So I expect you to solve this on your own based on the explanation given in our next so these are the these two diagrams that can help you to solve the problem related to our example that we are discussing now so all the important points are given to you all right so this employs a flash chamber so part of the vapor is bled off here mixed with the superheated uh, refrigerant coming from here before it's delivered to point number nine right so that is shown here clearly Right, so it's a superheated region. So 0.1 to 0.2. So this is 0.3. So this goes to 0.9, goes to 0.4, so on. And this is your point number 6. Right, and comes back to point number 7 here. So you should be able to draw this TS diagram. Right. Now the next thing that you should be able to do is find all your enthalpies from point number 1 to point number 9. Right. So let's look at the solution. So here, as I've mentioned, you have your TS diagram. So for this TS diagram, you are required to find all these values for H1 right up to H9. Right? So these are the values that you need to find. Now, you should not have a problem to find values such as H1, H2, right? H4, H5, H6, H7, H8. Now, how to find H9, we will discuss in the skeleton here. All right. So, again, let's look at the assumptions. So, you have steady operating condition. Kinetic and potential, we will neglect that. And we assume that the flash chamber is adiabatic. So, TS diagram is drawn here. All right. So, you note that the refrigerant leaves the condenser as saturated liquid and enters the low pressure compressor as saturated vapor. All right. So, that is shown clearly here. So for part A, we are required to find the fraction of the refrigerant that evaporates as it is throttled to the flash chamber. Right? So all you need to do is just find the quality at state 6. So just find the quality at state 6. So it comes out from here in the flash chamber. So we find what is the quality of state 6. Right? So I hope you still remember the formula from your thermodynamics classes. So you rearrange them and then you should be able to get your x6. Right? So this x6 here... It will be, uh, you can leave it either in decimal points or you can put it in percentage, right? So for part B, we will then use the amount of heat removed from the refrigerated space and the compressor, right? So here, because part of the vapor is bled off, right? So QL, we will need to then subtract it from 1, right? Unity value, H1 minus H8. That will give you the uh, answer for amount of uh, heat removed from the refrigerated space. All right? And then for the compressor, as you can see here, uh, we have total refrigerant going in here from uh, H4 to H9. All right? All right? And from H2 to H1, all right? because part of it is bled off, so you need to then use this relationship. So using that, you should be able to find what is the work uh, input for both the compressors. Right? So that will solve for part B. Now you have a problem here because we don't know what is our H9. So for H9, you use energy balance in the mixing chamber. Right? So you have the total refrigerant 
and then this total refrigerant and then it's divided into two parts one is going to h3 and then another one is going to h2 right so that will give you the value for h9 that you need right so once you know your h9 find what is your s9 right so enthalpy at state 4 right which is equals to at this pressure and s4 is equals to s9 you can find what is your h4 so that will give you the value that you need for your compressor work done and coefficient of performance once you know your ql once you know your w in then substitute it into this formula and that will give you the value for your cop so please try this question it's a very interesting question especially you need to understand why you have this right so if there are any questions related to this formula you can ask me in the uh, discussion forum later right and we will then discuss it further if you still can't get what is the uh, reason why they are using one minus x6 here right Another innovative uh, refrigeration system that I would like to cover with you is the absorption refrigeration system. So this is the most widely used absorption refrigeration system based on ammonia water system. So you have ammonia water system. We will look in the diagram later on. So where ammonia serves as the refrigerant and the water is the transport medium. Right? So the work input to the pump is usually very small. Right, so that is why this is uh, very attractive because most of the work consumption is related to the pump and the COP of absorption refrigeration system is basically defined as QL over Q generation. Right, so the maximum COP of an absorption refrigeration system is determined by assuming that the entire cycle is totally reversible. Right, for an example, the cycle involves no irreversibilities. And any heat transfer is through a different temperature difference. So the refrigeration system would be reversible if the heat from the source, which is your Q gen, were transferred to a Carnot heat engine and the work output of this heat engine is supplied to a Carnot refrigerator to remove heat from the refrigerated space. All right? So that is the reason why uh, you use QL over Q gen. Now let's look at the diagram of the uh, absorption refrigeration system so here it shows you the diagram of a typical absorption refrigeration system and whereby you are using ammonia and water all right so this is a, a form of refrigeration system that becomes economically attractive when you have a source of inexpensive thermal energy so for an example, your solar energy, you have geothermal energy, all right? So if this input of energy is inexpensive, all right? And this is made available at a temperature of between 100 to 200 degrees Celsius. So then you call this as the absorption refrigeration system. So you have very uh, various examples of this inexpensive thermal energy sources, all right? So as I discussed earlier, you can use solar energy you can also use geothermal energy and not forgetting whatever waste heat from cogeneration or processed steam plants and even natural gas when it is available at relatively low prices and that can be used to drive this component of your qgen so as the name implies right so absorption refrigeration system involves the absorption of refrigerant by a transport medium so here our transport medium is h2o so more widely used absorption refrigeration system is our ammonia water system. So ammonia serves as the refrigerant and water is the transport medium. So we have other absorption refrigeration system which includes water lithium bromide and water lithium chloride system. So where water serves as the refrigerant, right? So that's the reverse. So the latter two systems are limited to applications such as air conditioning where the minimum temperature is above the freezing point of water. So this, this is uh, some innovative uh, refrigeration system. So if you want to know further, please read through from online materials to understand further about this type of uh, innovative refrigeration system. So these are the practice problems, right? So uh, this will be the end of uh, our lesson today. So before I end, I would like to advise you to do these practice problems. We have a total of five practice problems, right? So the problems are given to you 
with the answers shown here. So you should uh, try all these questions, right? Uh, it, it goes on from a simple question and then uh, as we move on, you have Carnot, reverse Carnot cycle, actual ideal compression refrigeration cycle and actual refrigeration cycle. So you have a total of five questions. So please try all of them, right? So uh, we, if you have any problem, we will discuss it in our next class. And uh, that will be the that is the end of our refrigeration cycle. So based on uh, this chapter, you should know what is a refrigeration cycle represented on a Carnot cycle. And then uh, what is our ideal refrigeration cycle compared to actual refrigeration cycle? What is isentropic efficiency related to the compressor? And how to select refrigerants? What are the type of refrigerants available? And what is the importance of refrigeration in our daily life? And give some examples based on the refrigerator, heat pump, and also air conditioning that you have we use domestically and how refrigeration is applied in on a big scale right based on chillers and also uh, cold room that we've discussed earlier and uh, make sure that you understand and you do all the examples that we've discussed in this chapter so with that i thank you for your time